Joachim Addy, can you hear us? I um, can hear you loud and clear. What's that about me dancing? What's that about me dancing? <laughs> I don't know. Are you a good dancer, Professor? Would you call yourself a dancer? Well, I, you know, I have, I've had my moments, <laughs> you know, going back, back in the day. Maybe not recently, but not so much recently, but back in the day, I could, yeah, you know, I could move a foot. You could know. move one foot or two, just the one. <laughs> probably two, probably two, if, if absolutely necessary. Hello, 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 Very Professor. Fun. This is <laughs> this is Keith Palmer. I've just cut in there just so you know there's someone else on the other line because I don't want you kind of all of a sudden thinking Judith has had a, a voice problem. <laughs> no, no, no. I kind of I kind of worked out there must be two of you and probably different genders and all that kind of business. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All of them thing there. Now, Prep, you are the first african british historian to become a professor of history in the uk well what a pleasure to speak to you my goodness me when did your love well, for history begin i mean that's quite something for you to be the first well i was going to say when did you get the title yeah well yeah i mean i suppose that's um that's something but in a way it's uh it's... oh we've lost you Hello. Hello. Can, yes, just say that again. You said. Hi. Yeah. Could you keep the, you got the phone right next to your mouth? Right next to me. Yeah. Right next Fantastic. to me. Fantastic. Hear you nice and loudly now. Great. So we were saying about. Yeah. I, go on. No, no, no. You, you were talking about being the first. And yes. So on, and I said that uh, that's not really a, a cause for celebration. It, it's more. Uh, highlighting the problems that we have in this country. Mm. Um, very few people um, who certainly who came through the British education system um, rise to the rank of professor. Um, and yeah, I was the first one to do that. I think, to be honest, I'm there are only three at the moment. And I think I'm the only one from infant school, primary school, secondary school, undergraduate degree, postgraduate degree, you know, all that kind of thing. I'm still the only one. Mm. This is 20, now 2023. Yeah, you're so that, right. That suggests to me there's a, a big problem around. No, and you are... So that's something we need to address. Yes. When did your love for history begin? What what caught you, made you go, this is me? Well, I've actually very very young somebody else asked me that question today i was very very young when i got into history i was probably about four four something like that i would say uh about four really? yeah that's a long time ago yeah yeah about four yeah about four and in those days this is long ago. you won't remember this too this long before your time <laughs> go on tv about a, a, a geezer called Robin Hood. A Robin Hood, yes, we all know Robin Hood <laughs> from Nottingham. Yeah, but I don't know whether you remember that Robin Hood. Anyway, this is a long, long time ago. But it was a series about Robin Hood, and um, you know, Robin Hood, you know, took from the rich to give to the poor yes. and all that kind of business. That that really, to be honest, that is what sparked my interest in any kind of history. And so when I was very, very young, I used to read, you know, history books for kids about different, you know, British figures, um, you know, some legendary like Robin Hood, some maybe more um, uh, whose, whose lives have actually been documented in more detail. But in, in those days, it, would, it tended to be, you know, the kind of history that was served up for kids, you know, the great and the good, the the the, the, the whatever, you know, I don't know who, the, the Nelsons and the yes, the cool. kings and the queen, all that kind of thing. So that's how it started. That's how it kind of started my interest in history in general. And when did the African perspective kick in then? Well, that was a little bit later. I was probably about... about mm, about 13, probably. Wow. 13, a little 14, bit later, 13, you know, still a little child, but still. Yeah, it took, it took me 10, 10 years <laughs> or so to to kind of realise that the sort of history I was reading and learning at school didn't include, 
you know, anybody who looked like me and mm. didn't include, you know, um, and obviously didn't include anything relating to Africa and, and so on, and Africans or people of African heritage. And uh, growing up, you know, back then in the last century, uh, when things were a little bit tough, you know, there's a lot of racism around. And the, the two things hit me really at the same time, the, the kind of racism that was around in general, on the, you know, on the streets and in the, on the, con- in the country in general. And then this, this absence of, um, you know, you could say positive role models, heroes, or just, just anything relating to our history. I kind of connected the two things very quickly. And as a, as a as a teenager, you know, you want your own sense of identity. Really, you're you're searching for you know ways of expressing yourself and thinking about yourself and thinking about your place in society and and not finding anything that I could relate to. Um, you know, I began to do my own research. Really, that's that was to, to anything to do with Africa, anything to do with Africa and Africa. And did you, matter what it was, it could. Did, you, did yeah. you come across any obstacles around that time? Because obviously it wasn't in the curriculum. You, you it had to do your own research. What, what obstacles did you come across? Yeah, I mean, that was the main obstacle. The main obstacle was there wasn't any information. And obviously back at that time, there wasn't any internet. So it wasn't that you could easily go somewhere and find information. So I had to be a bit of a, a researcher, you know, I would maybe go to a bookshop and maybe I'd find a book and then I'd see, okay, well, what books does this writer talk about? And then I'd try and get those books, you know, I'd either go, I'd order them, you know, from a bookshop or I'd maybe go to a bigger bookshop and just see what I could find. And it could be any, anything. Um, you know, it could have been about history. It might have been about African history. It might have been African American history. It might have been about, you know, human trafficking and enslavement. It might have been about music. I remember in those years, I used to read a lot about, you know, the kind of origins of jazz and the origins right. of the blues and these kind of things because those were those kind of books were seen to be kind of more available and um, and they were important to me because they. They kind of showed that, um, you know, the Africans had contributed very important things to the world, even if it was music or whatever it might be. Um, so I, I was, I got into all those things. And then, yeah, I remember I won a, a prize at my school. It's probably the last time I ever won a prize. Um, <laughs> and I, so I asked for the prize. I asked for two books on African history. Um, and then I used to read, you know, political things, you know, uh, Black Power, you know, Stokely Carmichael yes. or Franz Fanon, all these guys. I didn't, probably didn't really understand them completely or even a little bit, but I used to just read them and try and take from them what I could, you know, positive things, positive energy, positive, positiveness, positivity. And, um, yeah, that's how I kind of started. And was it a situation where you you thought to yourself, I want to become a professor, or was it just through all the studying that you've done, all the academia, it just happened, it just turned out that was the the, the, the natural route for you to go? Well, I I always explain to people that I'm a, a kind of failure, I'm a failed school teacher. <laughs> I, I started off, I wanted to I wanted to be a school teacher and, and teach history, um, you know, because I thought that I could teach people the history that I hadn't been taught. Um, so that was my original aim to be a, to be a school teacher. But unfortunately, um, or, for, or fortunately, for, unfortunately, I, <laughs> well, for, I, well, what happened was I decided to go and study African history at, at university, which I did. But then when I, I left, I tried to get into teacher training in college and I got rejected everywhere that I applied. So, you know, the, the, to cut a long story short, and I eventually realized that, um, you know, it, it was probably going to be difficult to to teach African history in schools or even in college. And the only way I could be able to teach it would be at a university. So I had to kind of go back and do a PhD and all that kind of thing. So, so there, there were a lot of obstacles because I actually did... 
Um, I actually did two PhDs or one and a half. Oh so God. yeah, there's always barriers, obstacles, problems, setbacks. Sounds like it just but like you anything st- else in life. Yeah, sounds like it just, just made you stronger. But so that you were talking about having to go to university. So you've been at the Chichester University for ten years. Tell us about. Uh, well, you know, 11 years. 11 years. Okay, 11 years. then. Let's not underestimate it. Let's give it the time. 11 years. And you've 11 been... 11 and a half. Right. <laughs> so you've been there. You've been teaching. And uh, the, mm-hmm. you brought this course there. And so tell us what's been going on then. Because this is all up in the air now. It's up in the air, as you put it. Yeah, I mean, we started the course. The course actually arose from a, a conference that we had in 2015 called History Matters Conference. And we held that conference to discuss why there were so few young black people in this country engaging with history at what we could say academic level, both at school and university. You know, we found that amongst young black students, uh, history was the third most unpopular subject. Only veterinary science and agriculture are more popular. Wow, okay. (laughs) We found that a bit strange because, as you know, you both know, at community level, there's a lot of history things going on, you know, Mm. heritage walks and projects and all all of things are going on relating to history and so on. So we found that rather strange. Um, Anyway, we tried to look into it and we tried to engage with people we thought should be concerned and nobody was concerned. So we held our own conference and we got young people to come speak, People, young people at school, undergraduates, postgraduate students, some school history teachers. And we looked into what was this, what was this problem? And one of the recommendations of that conference was that to set up a course for older students, we can say mature students, people who loved history, um, but had been put off history, if you like, by their experience at school mainly, or maybe even at university. So there's a lot of people like that. So that's where the masters, the MRES, as we call it, in the history of Africa and the African History Matters Conference in 2015 was actually supported by the University of Chichester. Um, we said to them, okay, we want to set up this course, bring people back into education, particularly gear it at students of African and Caribbean heritage and bring them back. The course was set up. We've run it since January 2018. We think it's very successful in the sense that we've been managed to recruit students not just from Britain, but from the US, from Canada, from Africa, from the Caribbean, from Asia. And we've produced, we've gone on to do PhDs, six of them at the University of Chichester, and one of those received her PhD about a month ago. Wow. So in, in that sense, we thought it was very successful. Yes. The, the, the downside was we didn't have as many students as we would have liked, but every year, you know, I used to complain, why doesn't the university market this course effectively? You cannot just put it in the prospectus because who is going to look at the prospectus of the University of Chichester? Most people have never even heard of Chichester, right. let alone its university. Yep. So unless you understand that there's a problem in the sector, that black people are alienated from the sector and from studying history in it, you have to go above and beyond to actually recruit that wasn't done and we used to do most of our recruitment by word of mouth and social media we recruited every year but not large numbers nobody at the university complained about those numbers until this year and then in may i was told that uh the university had economic problems it was going to review all of its master's level programs and if they didn't reach a certain target they would be suspended and uh, you know their feasibility looked into and so on. What, so, what, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Well, they said that um, a program needed to have at least six students in it. Yeah. Uh, but I should explain that I should explain that if you set that target in May for a, a program or for a course that's going to start in September, mm. you clearly don't get a very accurate picture of how many what the numbers are going to be because a lot of people enroll between May and September because 
human beings being human beings, people do things at the last, last minute. minute. Absolutely. With the MRES, there was an additional factor in that that program actually recruited or enrolled twice a year. So we have students starting in September. We also have students starting in January. So I explained to the, you know, my uh, line managers that, okay, if you take just the figures we have now in May, that will disadvantage us, or we could say discriminate against us, mm -hmm. because we recruit twice a year. You can't just take our figures for once a year. So uh, I think we had at that time, you know, five students or some, something like that. And so they said, okay, they just, you know, came back about 10, 10 days later and said, well, the course is suspended. It's eff effectively closed, but they call it suspended because they want to call it suspended. So, okay, I um, immediately protested. I went to the deputy vice chancellor of the university who's responsible for equality, diversity, inclusion. I said, look. This is a only course in the country, in Europe, in fact, wow. which focuses on the history of Africa and the African diaspora. So people can choose what kind of research they do. It might be on Britain, it might be on Africa, it might be on the Caribbean, it might be in the, on the US, it could be on in anywhere, it could be on Asia, anywhere where, where there are Africans in the world, people can research it. So I said, look, this is a unique course, firstly, why are you and you're responsible for EDI? Why are you closing it down? Secondly, it's a course that recruits 95% students of African and Caribbean heritage yes. in a very white university. Thirdly, it's a course which has brought six or seven, six PhD students to the university in the last few years. Surely, if you're concerned about equality, diversity, inclusive, you must be. You must favour the course. You must, you know, want to, you know, you must want to retain the course. And I was told, well, no, he couldn't, that person couldn't say anything to me, couldn't do anything. It was all, you know, being decided somewhere else. So that was the basic picture. And I asked him, well, what's going on? Why, why are you ignoring all these issues of equality and so on? And he told me, well, it's all about um, cost cutting. So then the penny dropped. I said, ah, so what you mean is you want to make me, you want to get rid of me. Mm. Because the only way the university can save money is by getting rid of the people that employ us. I'm not sure whether he actually confirmed that was the case, but it was clear to me that was what was going on. But I wasn't officially told that what was going on for about another six weeks. So I went away. I had a you know a holiday. I did other things. Mm. I had this on my mind all the time. Of the course. university is basically going to get rid of me, but it won't tell me. And then in June. Uh, no, actually July, I think. In July, a few weeks ago, I was called to a meeting where he officially told me or finally told me, well, we are, universities linking your employment to this particular course. And I said, well, why would he do that? I does not in my contract that I'm contracted just to teach one course. Right. I've taught other courses. I supervise, you know, 10 PhD students. Um, again, and most of the vast majority of the 90% of African and Caribbean heritage, why would my post be tied to this particular course? I mean, you might as well tie anybody's post to it. I said, okay, well, that's, that's the situation. So that's, in a nutshell, that's the situation. I said, you know, have the students been told what's going on? I was told no. I said, well, I'm going to tell them immediately. And I informed my students what, what had happened, um, both to the the course itself, as well as to my own employment. And then, you know, the students decided to bring out a petition and yes. to protest and to campaign and to take legal advice and all the other things which have happened over the last three weeks. So what are we at now? What is the stage now? Because those students, what, what's meant to happen to them if they get rid of you? How are they going to finish off what they're doing and get advice? Well, that's a, that's a very good question, Judith. And nobody's answering that question. Um, the, the fact that the university haven't even reached out to the students. Um, the students have reached out to the university. But the university hasn't contacted the students because they claim that everything is confidential. Mm. They can't tell them what's going on and so on. But what they have said is that they will, they will, you know, support them. That's basically what they've said. Of course, the students recognise that if the person who's a specialist in this history 
and who's been supervising them is made redundant, actually there'll be nobody at the university Absolutely. to support them. Absolutely. Nobody to supervise them. Yeah, so they're very angry and, and they're, I mean, I think the students may be about to make their own statement about what they're going to do. Um, but yeah, they're very angry. They feel let down by the university. The university doesn't isn't concerned about them. Obviously, isn't concerned about the calls. Isn't concerned about this kind of history. Is just something you know, kind of disposable, and who cares, and so. On. And I think the university didn't think that thousands of people would would protest. Yes. Um, now, can I just and that uh, people would be very concerned? Yes, sir. Can I just check? Now, I'm, I'm assuming that you've seeked some kind of uh, legal advice from some employment person yourself to to really check where you're at with this, or is it something that you have to just accept because the way it's been framed? Well, obviously, I have a, a union uh, that is supporting me. Um, I, I I don't want to say too much well, yeah, no, what the union is doing yeah, yeah. Or, or not doing, um, but let me say I have a union supporting me. The certainly the the students have legal representation. Actually, the 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 MRES course has legal representation. Um, so we'll see, and obviously, ultimately, there may well be you know tribunals and other things that that go on um i've also put in an official grievance to the university yes saying that i believe that um that i've been discriminated against the course has been discriminated against the students have been discriminated against let's let's, this is do you know what let's not talk too much about that because it's an ongoing thing and we don't want anyone to bring this up saying that um uh to to bias any situation that you're in at the moment legally whatever so what would be great is when it's Mm -hmm. resolved if we can get you back to find out which way it went or if there's things that we can do to actually kind of help the cause really that's not going to there are things that you can do now actually there are things that you can do now that people can definitely um people can definitely sign the petition i've signed um, it and shared it if you can, brilliant if all your listeners can go, go to change.org and you can just put in my name in the search hakeem and addy or hakeem addy in chichester sign the petition share it with other people we've had over ten thousand already in the last three weeks but wow. we need more we want everyone to express how they feel this is really the only cause that exists in this country or in europe and it's about defending our history really that's what it boils down to defend our history well thank you so much for that and i agree and we will stay in touch keeping so that we can keep that that, that kettle boiling and see what's going out there so we can keep reporting and updating on this information. I know you've got a Zoom meeting at five o'clock. So we want to keep you and, and, you know, all the best with all that's going on. Thank you so much. No, thank you. you Really, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much, Akeem. And And I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for your support. Take it easy, yeah? You you too. Take Take care, care. my lovely. Bye-bye. All right. Well, that was a call. I wasn't expecting. Yes, that's Professor Hakim Adi. He is teaching at the University of Chichester. He is a professor there, and they want they want to, by all purposes they have removed the course that he's been teaching. There's been huge protest. It's the only one in the country. This is how people, you know, can blatantly look in your face and go, "No, we, it's too expensive. We won't have that." Mm, yet we've got other things, guys. If you're listening, and you want to be supporting change dot org. Type in Hakim, H-A-K-I-M, or Adi, A-D-I. Sign it, share it. Thank you.